us. Um, and he's pioneering some technology for nonprofit um, CIC in Mexico to um, give the citizens there a voice to talk with their government. So those of you that were here and got to hear Ambassador Jacobs this morning, she did a great job of explaining the Bureau of Consular Affairs, and I'm just going to bring you back to what our number one mission is, and that's to protect the lives and safety of citizens that are traveling abroad. I probably should show you that slide as I say it. We also facilitate the legitimate travel to the United States through various different visa programs, and we work with children's issues with adoptions and abductions. The way that we do this, our main platform is travel.state.gov. That is the most highly visited State Department website, and it's one of the most popular U.S. government websites. Last year, we had over 51 million visitors that came. And if you look down at the bottom where there's that orange circle for the Smart Travel Enrollment Program, Somebody one day said, wow, if we can put all of this information out, maybe it would be cool to get some information back in. Um, and this was probably the dawning of the new media presence for the State Department Bureau of Consular Affairs. So the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program is an um, optional program for U.S. citizens that are traveling abroad to not only enroll with the State Department, but put in their various different itineraries so that when they're in different theaters abroad, if we need to get emergency messages out to them, we're able to do so via email, text messaging, that sort of thing. Um, last year we had over a million people that did enroll in the Smart Traveler program, um, but relative to how many people actually do travel in and out of the United States, it's not a real high number. The traditional flow that you see is we would determine that we needed to get an emergency message out, and so we would post that information on the web and then use the information culled from the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program to then email messages out and hope that those messages would go where they needed to go. Pretty quickly, people realized that there's ways to crowdsource our amplifiers and use more of a real-time social media model to be able to get those messages out. So here we are, we're now ingrained in the 21st century. And taking you back to what our number one mission is, it's to protect the interests of citizens as they travel overseas. And we are the authority. We are the ones with the official platform. I would pause right here to almost say, we are the ones that have to tackle on a daily basis, on a minute by minute, 24 seven cycle basis, that whatever we put out gives automatic authority, automatic weight. There's political implications. And so for us, we have our number one mission to protect people. We want to do that in 140 characters or less, but we also have to remain the authority. And that for us in the Bureau of the Consular Affairs is one of the, the largest tactical issues that we, that we deal with in social media. We have to create our brand of government and we have to do it as an authority, but we have to do it in a way that people care about what we're saying. So these are the ways that we do it. It's nothing new. Um, Facebook, Twitter, and Foursquare is becoming very effective for our needs, especially in times of crisis, because when people are checking in on Foursquare or other location-based um, apps, we are able to push emergency notifications and messaging to them. Right now, our iPhone, we have a smart traveler app. It is being developed for Droid, and it's going to come out this spring, so we're very excited about that. And the smart traveler app is basically taking all of the information that we have on different countries and culling it together so that people can shake their phone and um, learn about where they're going, what information they need to know in advance, and what travel warnings and travel advisories we have out. Well, that's great, but that's still us just pushing out the information. We're not necessarily still engaging. And the citizens that we serve demand that we engage. So essentially, we have been driven by the public to change the way that we direct the conversation. And even though we're the State Department and we're the Bureau of Consular Affairs and we're the website that everybody goes to as the definitive source, we have been forced to take control of our own brand. And the only way that we're able to effectively do that is to listen to the citizens we have best practices. I'm sure everybody in this room has seen a great list of best practices. I'm not going to read down the list. I think most importantly in all of these is how we listen. We talked about that earlier today through some of our speakers, and it's not just putting those effective messages out, but it's actually hearing how those are taken in. Um, 
a big thing for us is also how do we build our community and our brand before there is a crisis? What themes are we responding to in regular day-to-day 24-7 news cycles before things are getting up onto a CNN news ticker that we have to get out there? And that brings us to the last, probably the best, best practice, and that is how we measure success. Especially in government and in multi-generational government, usually people want to measure success by how many followers we have or how many people are retweeting us. And I will tell you that every day I am reporting on how many people have retweeted a tweet that we have put out. And that is a definite measurement of success for many people. But I'd like to refer back when Ambassador Jacobs gave her opening speech this morning to a recent event um, that came out of Mexico City in December. And I would like to show you how we measure our true success. So Embassy Mexico City decided that they needed to put an emergency message out to citizens. People were getting um, pulled out of buses um, rather violently. And it goes without saying that when your experience starts out with you violently being pulled out of a bus, what's about to happen next is not going to be pleasant. So we decided that we needed to get that message out. They originally started with the STEP program and show, you know, sending out the messages to the people that had registered in STEP and put, you know, posting the information on their website. But then they decided to tweet in English and Spanish. And I'm not going to take you through a dramatic reading, oh, come on, of what happens when people tweet, because I'm sure you are all aware. These are all retreat, retweets by local affiliates. Within 90 minutes, CNN had had us as breaking news. Oh, there we go. Okay, well, you know how it works. Within 90 minutes, CNN had tweeted it as a breaking news item. So over 6 million people had gotten the message that there was this emergency issue that was coming up. We needed to get information out to the citizens. We needed to make sure that we were telling them the information that they needed to know. Overnight, it was front page news. It was you know above the fold, and, and um, it was a great campaign and traditional PR and traditional getting the word out and that basic use of citizens give us their information and we're able to respond back to them when they need to. But it's an even better example of how that embassy and that consulate used the microblogging tools of Twitter to already establish a community in advance, a community that would listen to them. And it didn't matter how many of those people were actually tweeting when you saw the little bubbles. It mattered that that community was able to amplify itself and to do it in such real time that we were able to get the information out where it needed to be. So in the beginning, when Craig at FEMA warned us that a tweet doesn't stop the bleeding, that it's our job to decide what that data point is that will, those are our data points, and those actually do stop the bleeding. And that, for us in the Bureau of Consular Affairs, is how we measure our success. So today, what's very exciting is we get to talk with other practitioners that tell us about how they measure success, and probably even more importantly, how the citizens are driving what we're going to do in the future and where our next data points are. So thank you. Welcome to Citizen Engagement. Hi, I'm Phil Ashlock, and uh, I'm going to be talking about Open 301, um, which, if you're not familiar, is a collaborative model and an open standard for civic issue tracking. Uh, it's, it's both this the uh, sort of model of how uh, citizen interactions can be more open and an actual technical standard for a web API that can be implemented independently around the world um, to facilitate that. Um, for those who aren't familiar with 311 services, uh, 311 was originally created as an as a alternative channel to 911 phone calls because people were calling in uh, to 911 for things that weren't an emergency, so all sorts of quality of life issues, graffiti or street light that's out, um, as well as just basic calls for information. Uh, so 311 really encompasses a broad range of, of what's going on in, in the life of a city. And by opening that up, you sort of can facilitate much uh, broader conversation about you know, the issues that are going on in, uh, in your city. Um, so just give you a sense of, so this is a, a, you know, a map of 3-in-1 issues in Lower Manhattan. Uh, uh, the screenshot was just taken a few days ago. Um, and to really get a sense of the pulse of the city in real time, here's a visualization where you can see sort of hour by hour um, the, the most common issues that are going through 3-in-1. The, the big pink one in the middle is noise complaints. Um, so this really sort of gives you this, the sense of, of the life of the city. Um, and, of course, this data is very geospatial, so you can see the hotspots, whether that's over the course of a year or the course of, a, of an hour. Um, 
And so the idea of opening this up and, and making it more collaborative was really first demonstrated by the service Fix My Street uh, in the UK starting several years ago. So a service like this lets people report an issue at a you know, set location to request you know, something be done about it. It's routed to the official authority, you know, usually a municipal government, uh, and then that whole process of getting it resolved can be tracked in public. And this model has been replicated around the world, most commonly seen in the, in the US with services like See Click Fix, um, but then everywhere you know, from Spain to uh, the Netherlands to Australia and Denmark and Germany also Germany, uh, service in Jordan, in India, uh, and then platforms like Ushihidi, which are open source uh, systems that facilitate this kind of thing. Uh, in this case, more commonly used for, for crisis response, but the same kind of model, uh, first starting in Kenya and then uh, you know, being used in the US and um, probably most notably uh, in, in Haiti. And so really, you know, we've been sort of seeing this pattern emerge with all these different uh, platforms doing the same kind of thing. Um, and you know, in some cases, particularly with cities you know, coming out with their own smartphone applications, it sort of seemed like everyone was sort of reinventing the wheel over and over again. And there was a, a clear need to, to come together as a standard. Um, and sort of the benefits of the standard, I think, were, were pretty obvious to a lot of people, particularly um, cities who started to see that you know, this, this pattern was repeating without coordination. Um, so starting with uh, what was actually already happening at the municipal level here in Washington, D.C., with the first ever web uh, API to allow people to interact with the 3 one system through their own software, um, we started to advocate this notion of, of creating a standard around that, starting several years ago and, and developing support from other cities, support from the White House, and now, after a couple of years, we have a majority of major cities um, in, in North America actually starting to implement this. Uh, Toronto just went live this week, um, and um, there are cities around the world uh, beyond North America in the UK and uh, in across South and Central America that are also implementing this as well. Um, and so some basic statistics, you know, we have companies that are implementing it in their existing systems for, for handling through on one, uh, this open source ecosystem that's developing. Uh, so these are some of the companies that are, that are supporting it and implementing it. Uh, some of the open source uh, software, including this uh, really great iPhone app that works with any city that supports it that was actually developed by uh, the city of Bloomington, Indiana, and developed such that any other city could, could reuse this for their own purposes. Likewise, uh, sort of the, the back-end system, uh, this is an example of one developed by Miami-Dade County, um, also made available for any other city to, to use. Um, great contributions from the uh, Code for America team, so a dashboard and Facebook integration, uh, workflow management, some of the other apps that are supporting it, the Fix My Street uh, is also an open, pla open source platform that's being officially used with some cities in the UK and is also supporting the standard. Um, and so often sort of I have this notion of a civic network um, and, and that it kind of comes as my response to when people ask if this, if this is a sort of like standard you know, unified platform and you know, much like 3 one is a phone number, is a standard phone number, but it routes to the different call center depending on where you are. And really that model is, is what, this, the same kind of model that I'm talking about, where the web is really you know, this distributed system, but there's only one web. And I, I think that's what we're trying to accomplish here with the civic web. Um, and, and this is a good example of, I think, how that can be accomplished. Another question that comes up is 3 one one uh, is typically and it goes through a call center, like 911 call centers as well. And so how does that relate to a web standard? And the answer to that is there's a variety of systems now that allow you to very tightly integrate uh, a phone call with a web API, and we've already seen some great examples of that being sort of tested out as a proof of concept. To give you a sense of where this is going, um, the, one of the most common things that uh, comes in through a 311 call center, the majority of calls actually are, are not to report problems like, like what I've been going through uh, so far. It's to ask a basic question about you know, what information about a city service and things like that. So we started to create standards for that as well, you know, the sort of the, the be able to submit a question and get an answer back of, from this big knowledge base of, of uh, issues and of questions and, and services in the city. So New York City is the first to deploy sort of a, a draft uh, proposal and, and they have a live API for that. Um, and sort of going a little bit further, we see this as not being something that's just to respond with answers, but also to be able to allow people to submit new questions and ultimately to let um, you know, citizens ask questions of one another and to allow the city to ask questions uh, to, to the citizens. Uh, New York actually uses, uses existing platforms like Quora to do that, and I think, um, you know, you may, may be familiar with other sort of ideation platforms, and to sort of go through that, uh, the different phases. Right now, you know, we have a standard for issue report, so for people report, reporting a problem, and now we're developing one for people asking questions, and then the next stage would be letting people, you know, answer those questions or suggest solutions. Um, 
some examples of that that we've started to experiment with are, you know, people instead of reporting uh, like a, a broken um, bike rack, they can report where a bike rack is needed. Uh, New York City is about to launch their their bike share program, so we worked with the city to to put together a map so that people could su suggest where those bike uh, share stations should be. Um, and I think you know this model is familiar to anyone who's been engaged with the Open Government Initiative and these ideation platforms. And so really I think that's the next stage of this standard where you can really be anywhere and you know that there's a way to interact with your, uh, with your government. And there's already some great sort of proof of concepts of those three different models being uh, integrated into one system. So this uh, platform we're better to work in uh, the Netherlands on one map, you've got problems, you've got questions, and you have ideas. Um, likewise, platforms like Get Satisfaction combine all of those, and uh, governments like the state of Texas actually use it to, uh, to do all those in one place. So that's a, a little bit of a sense of where things have been and where things are going with, with Open 301. Thank you. My name is Wendy Harmon. I work uh, at the American Red Cross. And so I'm just going to tell you a couple of little stories about how it is that we view citizen engagement and um, as it relates to technology and, and the social web. So, but first I'm going to turn off the screen. How do I make it go? Next. So uh, at the Red Cross is actually, when you're talking about the, the fire hose, and I think so much uh, has been discussed this morning about um, how much data there is and how do we make sense of it. Of it. Well, the American Red Cross is mentioned about 3,000 times during a steady state day. And I have a team of uh, three people, including myself, and we've uh, committed to reading every single one of those mentions and responding to a whole bunch of them. But uh, what happens when there's a major disaster is that that number 3,000 goes up exponentially. And that means that, uh, so for example, in the days after the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, we were fielding about 150,000 mentions, or, or that's how many there were, we were seeing. Uh, and we could quantify, but my three-person team, no way can we possibly read all of that, right? So what we've, what we've done is sort of started to adopt uh, an opposite world view which is instead of thinking about the three of us on our insular team uh, having to be the major engagers for the American Red Cross, what we're trying to do is start this initiative where every single person who works or, volu at or volunteers for the American Red Cross can become an engager and, and the public can, can become an engager as well. I think I'll get to that a little bit more in a second, but we, you've probably seen all of this this morning already, right? We've talked a lot about situational awareness. We've talked a lot about um, spotting trends that are upcoming. You know, where's the, the cholera outbreak moving in Haiti? Uh, and the th the, that third point, though, I think is the one that's the key for us in this panel, which is um, how do we provide resources and comfort in real time uh, to people who, who need it? How do we meet them where, where, they're, where they're at? So this is probably a, a much more inelegant way of saying what Craig Fugate said this morning, which is that uh, the public has to have a vital role in, in the process of disaster response. And we've got to make room for them. They're no longer a liability. They're a resource, right? And so what we're trying to do is figure out how do we sort of tear down the fortress wall of, of the American Red Cross in this institution, which uh, is still really important and really you know, valuable and efficient in a disaster response, but how do we include the public more in, in uh, executing on that disaster response? And we can find out a whole lot about it uh, by including the public. So what we've started to pilot is a digital volunteer program. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of, of this e experiment that we're undertaking, which is we just have invited the general public to say, yes, I'll, I'd like to be someone who can provide comfort, resources, information during, during a time of disaster. And so what we started out doing was just giving them some keywords to look at and some Facebook pages. We, we all know in this room probably that the second a tornado hits, there's like six different um, thought leaders in that particular community who have created a Facebook page dedicated to resources about the, the incident. And so it becomes um, really hard for us to keep an eye on everything that's happening so that we know uh, the information that everyone is sharing with one another. 
So if we spread out and decentralize those efforts and really uh, empower any given person who wants to do it to hop in there on behalf of, of the Red Cross or even just themselves to offer uh, whatever it is that they know about, the, about where the shelter is, where the emergency response vehicle might be, or something that has absolutely nothing to do with the Red Cross. And we've seen a lot of, uh, I've heard a lot of discussion about what is the actionable data. So you have 3,000 mentions every day. How much of that can you actually act on? And for us at the American Red Cross, I think the answer is a little bit more nuanced in that you know we sort of started this project and, and, and talking about these issues after Haiti, when I was seeing tweets saying, at Red Cross, I'm stuck under the rubble in this particular supermarket in Port-au-Prince, and having that information sort of land like a thud on my shoulders, and not having any way to get help or even alert uh, anyone that, that that was happening. Uh, but in the United States, and for domestic disasters, I think we see uh, different kinds of of actionable data, and most of it is actually emotional. Because going through something like this is really, really difficult uh, and scary. And especially, so my example is during the spring storms of this past May, there, I think there, were, there was a week straight where I sat in, in my living room at night and would just watch the hashtag tornado blowing my hair back, right? Thousands and thousands of tweets every night because there were so many tornado warnings. And I started seeing this trend of people using the hashtag bathtub. And they were, uh, it was just hundreds and hundreds of people each night who happened to be, they may have even been with their family, but they were going through a tornado warning in that very moment. They're in their hiding in their bathtub with their family or alone, but they have no connection to the outside. You can't really bring your television into your, into the bathtub with you. You can't um, and so they were feeling a little bit isolated and just reaching out. And so this is one of the many, many tweets that, that we saw. And so I just started connecting those people with one another. And there was, we sort of crowdsourced for one guy one night, uh, you know, which place would be the safest place for him to stay within his house. And so that kind of real-time comfort, I think, is the value for, for us in that citizen engagement and in really decentralizing and allowing everybody to participate and help one another. Because we can't be in every single place at every single moment. So uh, you guys can read. And, and what we're really trying to go for in the future is to really execute our mission on the social web. There's no reason that in the 21st century the American Red Cross cannot be providing almost the exact same services that it provides in real life on the ground um, on sites like Twitter and Facebook and whatever is to come next. So thank you very much. Hi there. So that, that's a bold vision and, and a real exciting one, too. Um, so I'm going to talk to him, Jim Hornthal. I'm with Politeer. And Politeer is a brand new listening, engagement, and action platform for social media. You saw Adam Bow earlier, if you were in the room, give a brief demo on how it's ingesting, in his case, the Egyptian presidential election, news, blogs, tweets, Facebook, and social video. The, the frame for this conversation, for this panel, though, is traditional CRM, customer relationship management, which designed the Salesforce tool and made famous by salesforce.com, is a way that commercial businesses can source qualified leads, generate prospects, whether it's direct mail, advertising, telemarketing. And the objective in a corporate sense is to get, keep, and grow customers. It's pretty simple. You want to monitor the sales cycle. You want to close business, generate revenue, retain customers, and improve customer satisfaction. So the question is, what models and lessons can we take from the private sector and apply to civic CRM, or citizen relationship management? And are there parallels where we can see an organizational tool? The leads, in this case, are social signals. The leads are responses to <coughs> needs through Twitter, Facebook, blogs, and news. And here, the objective is constituent responsiveness and the monitor progress of activities to be able to respond and resolve issues, uh, recognize opportunities where they may exist, and ultimately improve the satisfaction with the agencies and services that we're empowered to provide. So the question is, what are you doing now to address these needs? How are you identifying top issues, positive, negative, for you, and if there are competitors in your marketplace and other service providers for them? How do you measure the effectiveness? Because the investments you make every day, both in people and resources, ultimately you want to be accountable. Whatever metrics are important to you, how are you measuring them? 
And what about the staff efficiency? How quick are they responding to critical actions and assignments? What's the accountability, uh, especially in crisis? And what are you doing now to learn about breaking stories and trends? A lot of you probably are using traditional tools, some form of a clipping service, which is a great way to look through the rear view mirror uh, and recap things that were important yesterday. Um, traditional war rooms may be set up in times of crisis with TV sets and Google Alerts and people on TweetDeck or Hootsuite, and if the content grows, you just throw more people at TweetDeck and Hootsuite. And those were okay when we had a 24-hour news cycle. The world moved at a slower pace. There were a limited number of major networks, cable broadcast, newspapers, magazines, if we all remember what magazines used to be. Um, and you could identify the key influencers. You kind of knew which writers, authors, journalists, had something to say, and you'd listen to them. And that, that was a much easier time. Now, the tsunami of data is pretty astounding. There's 250 million tweets a day, 2.7 billion Facebook post likes and comments, 250 million photos. This blows me away. 48 hours of YouTube video are uploaded every minute. Uh, 40,000 content sources, news blogs, forums, message boards, and videos. Um, Eric Schmidt. Uh, gave a talk uh, clarifying on some data that someone mentioned earlier today. From the dawn of time when mankind first drew on the walls of caves until 2002, we as a species created five exabytes of data. Now, an exabyte is a billion billions. Today, every two days, we create five exabytes of data. Now, how can I get my head around an exabyte? If we took the entire planet of the Earth, which is estimated about seven billion people, and if we made it every person's job, man, woman, child, infant, to count from one to one billion, 10 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, it would only take us 33 years as a planet to an aggregate of counted to five exabytes. Kind of makes your head hurt. Today we're dealing not with a 24-hour news cycle, but a 24-minute news cycle. So what is a challenge for all of us is to figure out how you can make time be your friend in a very hostile time environment. More content to absorb slows you down. You've got to analyze the implications, the alternatives, the priorities, and the responsibilities. And response time is actually critical, in some cases, very critical. So we have improved tools today. There are ways of taking content and capturing it in real time. It's not about the megaphone, someone was saying earlier, it's about the listening devices. But then in these war rooms of the 21st century, what do you do with it? I mean, it's nice to have a dashboard that shows me items, but I need to assign responsibilities. I need to have alerts that tell me when something is really going on. I used to call them hair on fire alerts, but that didn't work very long. Um, so this isn't a, just a retread of what Adam showed earlier, but the dashboard is a way of looking at trending stories. There was a story this morning in a meeting I was in that had 5,750 mentions in the last three minutes. That sounds important. And it's not a question of who I follow on Twitter but how a story is going through the social universe to understand relative impact, relative priority. It lets us do predictive modeling. When's the last time I saw a story like that? What, how did that story behave and how big did it become? Because the news cycle shouldn't manage you, you should manage the news cycle. This is very key. And you probably can't read that. This is saying, as someone on the dashboard, this is important to me. I'm going to assign the task. I'm gonna say, Wendy, please analyze this. High priority, I need it on my desk by tomorrow. I can say, Phil, call this person. I can assign it to a volunteer. But if I don't have a ticketing and an assignment, a responsibility, and a deadline, and I'm not measuring it, it's not worth measuring. And things that aren't worth measuring aren't important. But this is important. So the question is, assigning a ticket, I come to work, these are my ticket assignments. If I push the right button, I translate Arabic into English. But for those of you who read Arabic, I think these are important. A lot of these have to do with, I think, the Port Said soccer incident and the, and the armed services. All right, I'm working on my assignment now. I'm doing what you told me to do. I can report back to you my progress. So the same way as Salesforce.com lets CRM be managed in a Salesforce mentality for customer relationship, a lot of those tools apply here too. And I think if we're able to trigger alerts, if there are more than 50 uh, uh, mentions of Amr Musa and Israel within 30 minutes, email me, text message me, call me. Imagine the kind of alerts you could set and the people that would get them so that you can get ahead of the curve and not let time be your enemy. With Civic CRM, you can learn about breaking stories and trends, set alerts, measure effectiveness of the investments, people and resources, and measure the efficiency of the staff. How quickly are the people that are supposed to respond responding, and now it's very quantifiable and very accountable. So you can follow us at Palatier or myself at Hornthal, and I'll hand the 
a little quicker over to our next speaker. Thank you. Where should I point? <laughs> point, at <me. laughs> point at me. No one, Tana? You can keep my slides. Oh, there we go. There we go. So, uh, hi, I'm excited to be here. Patrick Kane from the Centro Integración Ciudadana, a nonprofit organization in Monterrey. Before I start, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, remind uh, myself of a quote that I heard last night over dinner with a friend of mine that sums up where, where everything, all of this started. And it's a quote from a, a professor from Stanford, uh, Paul Romer, and he said, um, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Um, <laughs> that's, that's essentially where, where we started in, in Mexico with the Centro Interacion Ciudadana. We were, we were actually going through a crisis, a uh, crisis of insecurity, a crisis of distrust with local authorities for the waves of violence that have been plaguing our city and country. And uh, we, we set, upon, set it upon ourselves to, to make the most of this, this crisis itself, to, to be able to bring, bring to bear uh, an opportunity to change, change mindsets to think out of the box and bring something that, that would, would change citizen engagement uh, that was traditional in Monterrey, very apathetic, to something more, more uh, proactive. So the, the Centro Interacción Ciudadana is a nonprofit organization that's promoting, facilitating, and processing citizen reports to enable collaboration with local authorities uh, for the betterment of the community. And within that uh, uh, charter, we have four service lines. One is providing aid to citizens and crime victims with legal and uh, psychological help, free of charge. Also trying to facilitate citizen reporting, uh, providing actionable intelligence on what's the, what are the happenings uh, surrounding their, their, uh, their uh, location, and promoting a culture of civic involvement. And uh, looking around at the social media, uh, uh, social networks, uh, the massification or consumerization of these technologies, we, we set about it our, to ourselves to, to think of a model that could integrate all of this together and uh, activate it in, in for good. Um, in our case, uh, one, uh, there was a prototype uh, model that started to emerge in, in Monterrey that was grassroots effort, an early warning system of uh, citizens that were creating anonymous accounts on Twitter and were aggregating citizen reports totally voluntarily. And these are some of the accounts that you see here um, right over there. These accounts, uh, what was fascinating to me when I started to see this, this or identify this dynamic was nobody knew about them. They had no risk history or track record. They had a, an influential cloud score, which I don't know if how many of you are familiar with the cloud score, but it's a standard of influence online. And when I compared the cloud score that you see on these anonymous accounts that had probably six months of life and massive amounts of followers, they were almost as high as a political celebrities in Mexico as a president. Uh, the president, I think, is somewhere around 80 or so. So you can have a relative comparison to that. Um, so that, to me, really it triggered, it triggered a, a notion that there was something that we could do that was farther beyond of a, a grassroots system and trying to build an organization on top of it that could to capitalize on what the dynamic that was happening already there to do it something for good. Um, so uh, as, a, as a complement to, to SIC, uh, the, the initials for the Centro Integración Ciudadana, we tried to build this collaboration platform using Ushahidi for data visualization and capturing citizen reports, and also leveraging uh, some other uh, technologies, CityVox particularly, and Twitter in, uh, in, uh, in joint to be able to capture reports, process them, uh, and follow up with actions to, to get this, this circle or cycle of virtual collaboration among citizens and public service agencies to get it rolling. Some of the numbers here, uh, obviously we need to extrapolate and think of it as a Monterrey, very sub-local level when you compare it to the numbers we've heard over here. But we have a, a, an interesting culture that, that emerged in Monterrey out of these anonymous accounts, which is the hashtag MTYFollow. I don't know if you've read this in the news, it, it came out in the Wall Street Journal, I think New York Times as well. And it's, a, again, a grassroots hashtag where people are reporting constantly what's happening in their surroundings. And uh, it, it's interesting because it's also a self-governing hashtag where if somebody is posting something that's more of a commercial nature, trying to market a product or something, he gets, he gets whacked. <laughs> or retribution uh, from other Twitter followers using that hashtag saying, hey, I mean, please, please be sure to use this hashtag for citizen reporting purposes, which I found fascinating. Um, 
we, there's about uh, 1,000 to 3,000 tweets per day on that hashtag, which is it's an interesting and growing number. Um, and there's also, uh, in a recent event back in August, which was a tragedy in Monterrey, the Casino Royale was set up to fire by, by drug cartels. Uh, unfortunately, 52 people died. Uh, the peak number of tweets that were running through the hashtag was 20,000 tweets. So you, it really went up five or sevenfold. The CIC MTY uh, account, which is ours, we, we, we run it 24-7 with three people full-time. It gets around 6,000 mentions per month, in which we're actively engaging citizens on their reports and curating their reports. And uh, we are, we're curating about uh, 1,500 reports per, per, uh, per month by, by citizens. And we're really noticing that Twitter itself is, is really a platform for us. 95% of all the, the reports or the engagement and interactions that we have with citizens are, come through Twitter. And just to, to give you a little bit more of a sense for what's actually the conversation that's happening in that hashtag or, or with, with citizens within the city, uh, there's, there's things like collaborating on car theft. There's a tweet that was, I found particularly fascinating. Uh, stolen black Audi with license plates SED 4023, stolen at the 7-Eleven in this location at 3 p.m., followed by another tweet later that day saying, I, ju I just saw that black Audi with the same license plate parked at the convex center at 350. So that sort of opens your eyes of what the, the possibilities and potential of situational awareness, being able to activate citizens to, to take decisions to participate as long as they're aware of what's, what's happening in their surroundings. So this is, this is what we have here, uh, Project Tewan today. So Tewan, uh, the, the name that we, we baptized this, this uh, initiative was, comes from the, the uh, Nahuatl native tongue, which means uh, us or we, and uh, it's funny, we, we were, I was inspired by Ushahidi, which, which is using the same, same notion uh, from Swahili for testimony. I thought it particularly interesting in hindsight, when you put those two together, it really feels more like the collective testimony, so our testimony. So in, the, in this platform itself, what we're doing is we're aggregating and processing multi-channel citizen reports coming from SMS, email, or Twitter. Uh, we're also visualizing the reports and the activity that's actually being, being provided geo-referencing, uh, making it time-bound, adding a category classification, and we're starting to, to provide a status uh, and follow-up on those, those uh, reports, giving them a ticket and making sure that, that uh, to stating these are open reports, these are closed reports, and following up with local authorities to make sure that they follow up on the, the uh, reports that citizens are providing. We're also distributing um, referenced and category-specific alerts for people that sign up to the platform as a standard Ushahidi uh, interface and also coordinating to optimize citizen reporting, uh, processing with, with uh, CIC and Twitter operators to verify the, the credibility and authenticity of the reports that are being provided. And um, the final slide here, uh, it's, for us it's really, it's been four months that we've been publicly uh, known. We have probably 20,000 or so uh, followers on, on Twitter right now. So I, I consider that we're, we're getting good traction. Uh, we've also uh, have coordinated efforts with also local institutions like Canacero or, or Cuparmex and Sinlac. Uh, private enterprise is also backing us. We, they've opened our doors to their, to their businesses to be able to come over and, and uh, share our story and uh, what services we provide as the CIC to their employees so they can, we can start building a trust network of citizens that can contribute and participate in, in, the, in the betterment of their communities. Um, and we've also formalized collaboration agreements with local municipalities to actionize or make, make all the citizen reports that we've received actionable. Because citizen engagement really doesn't go well when there's no action uh, that responds to that engagement. So that's one of the, the, the key things that uh, uh, the people at, at CIC are working on. And again, I think uh, we, we ourselves have, have been uh, well received. People who have received support at CIC have been given unprompted donations to, to the, the nonprofit, which has been great. And we're consolidating a, a strong Twitter base uh, to give us our, our, our reports. And uh, before, before I, I end this, I, one of the ideas that I'd like to share and, and contribute to the group here is um, an idea that I learned at McKinsey, which is um, there's this what we see here in social media and the networks that we're seeing is that we're a big network of human sensors here. And the challenge of trying to make this, this work is actually trying to transform the network that's already there into an organization that's actioning uh, change. And I think really moving the network to an organization that, that has processes will, will really be a huge potential. And capturing that potential I think is massive.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So instead of um, feeding them questions, I'm wondering if anybody out there has questions that you would like to ask. It's pretty informal, so if you have something, speak up. In the back. Yes. <laughs> um, my name's Maria, and um, I handle social media at the State Department for Francophone uh, audiences in Africa. And I had a question for uh, Wendy from the Red Cross. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, and this is kind of something that I deal with on a daily basis because not everyone has uh, Twitter, let alone electricity, where my audiences are. How do you handle um, kind of overcoming the lack of being able to be connected to any sort of network during a disaster to get people to communicate? Are there like certain points or people they can go to to spread the word for them? Or yeah, Well, so nothing we're doing here is replacing what the Red Cross has done in the past. And so this is, this is entirely supplemental and, and hopefully very complimentary. Um, and it just depends on the situation which technologies are still available and, and how much of the infrastructure. So we, uh, we just have to be really fast at finding where the people are figuring out how to communicate with one another and um, being able to talk to them in those, in those spaces. So it's just a very real time, I don't know if I'm even, I don't have a great answer for you. Uh, you know, we recognize that sometimes Twitter is not going to be up right after a disaster, but um, so far, mostly it is. Um, and one of the best examples I have of that is after the earthquake here, uh, you know, we couldn't even text one another for a little while, but people were able to post Facebook and Twitter messages. And finally, you know, for the first time, our head of disaster services came and found me. He goes, okay, I get it. <laughs> He's like, my daughter you know, was freaking out. She didn't know what happened or where we were, and um, we were able to share a Facebook message. So, um, just depends on the, on the issue. In the center. Hi, this is for Jim. Um, this is Andres Cavalier from uh, Fast Track Media. Um, who gets access to uh, Pollard Ear? Uh, I tried to uh, log in and couldn't. Yeah. And uh, do you have any other examples of uh, uses uh, in other parts of the world? Sure. Um, so Palatir has been in uh, stealth development until about noon today. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> congratulations, you were there at the launch. Um, we've got a couple of alpha clients now who are playing with it, and there'll be a more uh, appropriate landing page posted in the next couple of days, which will be simply stay tuned, we'll give you information. But it's designed not as a public tool. We're not appealing to consumers and trying to build page views and advertising. It's really a commercial client. Um, we've got some clients in the Middle East. Actually, there are people in Egypt now that are using the, the Arabic platform that we've created for the uh, elections, but not just for political needs, but in the civil society to measure signals within businesses and within uh, districts. Um, we're looking at other languages that we're going to be adding as well. Uh, it's tough, as you can imagine, trying to pick up sentiment in a language you can't understand, even if you could understand it. Um, there are some political clients. There's a corp corporate clients. Um, there's a, a well-known social network that's using us to monitor privacy and issues about privacy. So how would it be different from uh, Radiant 6 or NetVibes or other tools like that? Great question. Um, so. Many of the other listening platforms, you conform the way you work so that it fits your needs. Um, <coughs> the, the parent company of Politeer is called Monetier. You've seen the political version of the platform. And it's about having custom ontologies and taxonomies that are developed over time with clients so that it really fits their needs. Um, I think economically, when you fully price out, uh, you've got price issues as well. The question is how important are alerts? How important is a customized? infrastructure, uh, and how critical is the assignment ticketing and workflow? For some people, it's not. Uh, a lot of people are fine with TweetDeck and Hootsuite, and, and that's great. Um, but the problem is uh, today, Taco Bell, I think there was some salmonella issue going on, and now we've got their PR firm calling us to see if we can set up a dashboard tonight. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> no, actually, uh, we have every, there's 40,000 newspapers, magazines, um, 
blogs, message boards, and a lot more video sources than just YouTube that are ingested in real time, uh, as well as going back about two years. So New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, they're all in there. Up, uh, uh, Eretz, Jerusalem Post, Beirut Star, they're all in there. Hi, um, I'm Ann Hanakowitz, also from the State Department. I'm a Chinese social media analyst, and this is a question both for Karina and perhaps Patrick might also be able to answer this. Um, last week, we had the announcement that Twitter is going to censor according to countries' standards, but at the same time, they're going to be open about what they're censoring where. Um, how are you going to deal with these kinds of censorship issues? Because I can imagine that in times of crisis, a certain country or even a certain city might start deleting posts using a certain hashtag. Absolutely. Um, I think that we had, I wasn't on duty then, but I think that we had some experience with that in Egypt last year. And um, we were still trying to get information out to American citizens to help them evacuate the area. And one of the things that we relied on were our crowdsourced ampl amplifiers. So, <clears throat> excuse me, please don't tweet that at TravelGov is about to lose her voice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what we did was we were still tweeting, we were still using the same hashtags, even though we knew that um, in those regions, in those geolocations, that the information wasn't getting out to the average user, but there were news media that were able to get information, and then they would stand live on the air and read the tweets that we were putting out so that we could get information. So we did have um, crowdsourced workarounds that helped us still provide the information. I know that the State Department is committed to delivering 21st century technology wherever they can. And sometimes, you know, that is a very politically charged issue that comes up, but it is one of our goals as a department and in theater. Um, so, so each location is different, but each location offers opportunities for us to utilize um, the communities that we build in advance when we come up against that. On um, censorship, really, it's a great question. I still don't know how it will apply to our specific situation. I don't see it, it really uh, becoming an obstacle in our case, really, um, specifically. So I, I don't really know how to, how to address that question. Thank you. There was someone here. Um, so just given today's population being very much focused on instant gratification, and a lot of you are talking about accessibility and responding to the people that are tweeting and using Facebook. So what kind of models of staffing and infrastructure do you have to manage that, given that technology is 24-7, response is 24-7, especially in times of crisis? And how do you deal with that with staffing and also making sure that you're providing the support that this t technology can provide? Um, I guess I could, you know, just sort of giving some of uh, the precedent that already exists in like the three-on-one space. Um, I mean, tr with traditional three-on-one call centers, if you know, if they have enough staff to have a call center, which is is only the case for large cities, um, the de depending on the issue um, that's being called in, you know, the city will set a response time that they can um, that the citizen can expect. So I think the most important thing is like setting expectations appropriately. I think there's lots of situations where um, government can just be honest about their limited means to respond and sort of, um, you know, just be frank about that and provide as much of infrastructure as possible. And, you know, if the policy, you know, climate is right, like maybe even say, uh, you know, we're giving, we, we can't respond to this, but maybe, you know, th this is a platform that you and your neighbors can use to respond to the issue yourself. Um, so that as a sort of model has been raised many times with the sort of open through and one concept. Um, but I think the most important thing is just being honest about, uh, about setting expectations accurately. Like I said uh, when I was speaking too, that I have a three-person team, uh, but we have this now 200 plus force of digital volunteers. We have a network of Red Cross employees and volunteers uh, that's very large. And that's the part of the before the disaster network building that's so important. So I'm on fairly constantly, even while I'm sitting up here. And I, uh, but I do go to sleep at night, I'm getting to be an only. So, uh, but the network is strong enough that if something's happening in the night, you, you know, like the Japan earthquake, I, uh, somebody just gave me a call and said, 
you know, take a look at what's happening. And so then we can get up and we can start putting that fabric together. It's important enough to us at the Red Cross that we want to make every part of our, want to have social engagement be part of um, our operational DNA, right? So at every level, there's some access point and a network built in the same way that it is offline. And, and I think from the CRM commercial side, the same lessons apply. Um, when thresholds of activity occur, it will find you, but you can also automate responses to, to uh, your point earlier, Phil, about how long will it take. So the same way on hold, you get a message and your number seven on hold, an operator will be with you before you die. Um, in this case, you might be able to quickly respond via the same medium, via Twitter, via Facebook, where at least they know they were heard, and that requires no more staffing. That just requires some elegant code. In our case, uh, we have uh, three full-time people uh, manning our um, our Twitter accounts 24/7, and I think that's where where the benefits of the platform of Twitter help a lot because that Twitter is really an any-to-many -many type platform, so it's extremely efficient. I mean, you get a question, you can tweet it out to all your followers, and they're all aware of what what question was really asked. Like in a specific situation in our end, uh, when um, there's there's we usually get inquiries. Uh, we we just got a shooting going on at this this location within the city. And um, we don't want to confirm it right off the bat because we just, we're just hurting it first. And we try to do a roundabout of trying to figure out, well, what, twi what type of Twitter account actually sends us information? Has it a high cloud score? How many followers does it have? But at the same time, we're also tweeting out um, a question to all our followers. Anybody else in this location can confirm the event. And depending on that, we, we make that very efficient. So it's engaging people to join the conversation and making, again, the network part of the organization to, to, to respond. And I think that something that was touched on earlier is that you have to have a plan for this. You can't let what people are tweeting or putting, posting to you, <clears throat> excuse me, always dictate what you're doing. You have to be able to manage citizen expectations. Otherwise it is Wendy and me, people up all night. Um, and so there's a, a real time communications plan that's in place. And then there's an emergency communications plan. Obviously those are the nights that we're up. Um, but sometimes you have to look at, if I start tweeting on a daily basis and I'm putting 25 tweets out each day, can I sustain that? Or this, is this what my audience is expecting of me? And um, I really need to take a look at what those long and short term goals are as part of the plan. Uh, uh, Gary Vaughn with uh, <clears throat> e-diplomacy at the State Department. I, I had a question for Patrick and maybe for Phil on uh, and it's the big one of, uh, of risk and pushback when you're involved in activities like that you're tracking criminal behavior. Uh, how, do you, how do you grapple with, with pushback or people getting even for reports they hear on the, on the web, uh, either the organization being at risk or individuals who are doing this reporting at risk? Is it sort of safety in numbers as this grows and swells? And, and I'd be interested in here. are there any other models other than Mexico that sort of grapples with this issue of, of risk and, and, and pushback, not just from, from criminal elements, but from the government itself, corruption, it's, a, it's, a, it's courageous behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll answer that from different angles of how, how I've seen uh, the dynamic evolved in Mexico in particular. Well, one thing uh, uh, from starting off, uh, the Twitter accounts that usually start tweeting out sensitive information are usually pseudonyms. Um, they're, they're anonymous accounts. People really don't know who they really are. So that's the way that they protect their identity when, when they're sending out some, some information. But in, in our case in particular, I mean, we, our, our pri primary focus, and that's something that we really want to get across, is that we're, we're there to provide situational awareness of what's happening so, so citizens can avoid situations at risk rather than uh, try to point, point something that's happening. So it's, I just want to let you know what's happening so you can avoid it and avoid just being, getting caught in the crossfire or whatnot. So that's, that's, we're not directing towards that, but it, we're, we're trying to just avoid it. Um, um, what else can I say about the, the retribution? We, we've not seen it yet in our space, uh, particularly. Uh, we're really positioned to be a, a collaborative um, institution. We have no background since it's a new organization. We have no baggage. We're we're creating our brand. We're creating our image. We're creating uh, our our charter uh, from scratch. So that helps uh, quite a fair bit, as well. Uh, I guess just to to give you a sense of where things are at with the Open Three One effort, the the standard itself doesn't um, expose any personally identifying information and doesn't require any of that to be sent. Um, 
there's certain situations where you know you would want to to identify yourself so that you could you know for example you know have a phone call if, if needed or something like that but um, by default th that information is never made public um, there are I mean there is a lot more discussion sort of going on about how to better facilitate you know authentication privacy and stuff but for the most part I, I don't see this necessarily being any different than sort of what's already existed with um, you know 911 and 311 calls you know over the past couple decades um, the big difference is that you know for a lot of that data you know a lot of um, police departments actually do publish their data but it's you know maybe a month or years later and in this case um, the data is coming out you know in real time but it, uh, but it's not necessarily exposing any personally identifiable information so Thank you for this panel. Uh, my name is Lorelai Kelly. <clears throat> I'm currently writing a handbook for women in post-war environments on security sector reform. And it's known as SSR, but it's basically courts, judicial systems, and policing. It's the civilian coercion outside the military. And um, one of the things I'm looking at in the last year is that women are very involved on the front lines of activism, but they get, really get shut out once it becomes an institutional dialogue or institutions get built. And I'm wondering, what you're all doing, I think, is, is sort of really important first step in participation. Um, but have you seen examples of sort of standing support for public participation in real governance, long-term institution building? Um, and part of it's going to be real time, because what, what we're seeing also, if you're not present at the creation, you don't, you, and especially with women, women are props and uh, quotas. They're not in the leadership. We just saw this with the Egyptian parliament. Um, it, and it's really disappointing. Or they're involved in sort of the beginning of, of the liberation narrative, but then they're not there to carry it out. And I feel like cracking this nut of the public participation process that determines um, what these institutions look like is almost the most important part if you really want to have a pluralist society, certainly on the gender front. I don't know if that makes any sense, what I just said, but have you seen your work start heading in that direction, the standing infrastructure piece for public participation? We have the same problem in our own Congress. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well. I work for Secretary Hillary Clinton, <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, and she supports, uh, the State Department as a whole supports a train and trust model where it, um, it doesn't matter what gender we are, it matters what our, um, what our experience and um, professional knowledge base is, and we are able to speak to that. Although, interesting, if you're doing research and you still have to deal with pseudonyms and, and untrue personalities, uh, but more and more of social signals can be uh, gender identified. So it, it could be really interesting to watch the relative volume of trends on issues and topics and regions and see if there is a variation from the beginning, middle, and end of certain events and see if the voices become muffled not only in public but in private or if they continue and maybe even build more so in the social sphere. It's a fascinating question. The data is there. No one's really looked at it to my knowledge, but it's a great question. I'll give you a piece of data. Within our 20,000 follower base uh, at, at CIC, two-thirds of it is, is our, our women. Two-thirds of our, our, our follower base at Twitter that participates with reports are, are women. Thank you, my name is Felipe Stefan, I'm with the World Bank. I wanted to ask the question of how do you deal with the issue of legitimacy of crowdsourced information? Um, I had a previous work experience with an organization that shall, rename, shall remain unnamed, in which we retweeted a post uh, announcing a bomb threat that was not occurring because we had received reports of it through Twitter. Um, and it's still an issue that I deal with in the work that I do continuously. And so I was wondering if you have a structured or systemic or tested approach to verifying legitimacy of information that you receive from the crowd. Um, I, I, I guess, again, I would say, you know, my knowledge of this topic is, is probably just based on what I'm aware of being the precedent with, you know, existing, you know, 
telephone calls to 911 and things like that, which is, um, you know, oftentimes you ha you're sort of forced to assume something's accurate, but then do your best to uh, to confirm it through whatever means and resources you have. And I think that's going to vary depending on what situation you're in. But um, I think ultimately, oftentimes there becomes the need to create some kind of um, you know trust framework, or at least to you know if, if you de determine that some piece of information was untrustworthy, that you make sure that if you get more information from that same source again that you reconsider leaving it. So just being able to have better uh, means of managing those kinds of uh, patterns, I think, helps a lot. But, um, but I think it really is going to vary based on your resources. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the four axes that we try and track are sentiment, perspective, influence, and time. And time goes both forward in a predictive model and backwards. So to your point, if you see history of bad data, you begin to downscore the influence. And it's not just cloud. I mean, Lady Gaga has 18 million followers. She doesn't really have clout for things I care about, but well, maybe. Um, but if you look at the, but if you look at the um, the aspects of understanding the source or the nature, and who not, you might have 40,000 followers, but are 39,000 of them robots. If you really have authentic followers who continue to retweet your information with positive sentiment, then it's probably reasonable to assume that whatever that note of information was has some veracity. It doesn't mean you don't have to double check, especially if it's a crisis or life-threatening, but you can be more confident than if it's just a new account set up three days ago, no followers, 17 tweets on the same topic with negative sentiment. Someone has a grudge. And I would say we're not uh, going to be sending out a, a response vehicle because we see one tweet from someone who wants a sandwich. Um, so. But if we see, I've been waiting for a right. I, <laughs> I do like the food truck model, but it's not going to be that exact. So, so stay hungry. Right. Uh, but if we see a hundred in uh, people saying something like that in a specific geographic area, well, then by by the sheer number of of a hundred or whatever it might be that, that the threshold is. Um, then we think, OK, well, that might be some place that we need to send a response vehicle. And we sort of triangulate in whatever ways are available that information so that, so that we can act on it. I'll answer one last tidbit on that one. Um, I agree. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to verify the credibility of something. I think that that's one of the ultimate challenges, try to figure out what's your FICO score for credibility. And uh, really figuring out that FICO score for credibility is, is, is something that would be immensely valuable, especially as we move on to the edge where social media is incredibly predominant and mainstream. Um, I agree cloud score is not the, the right. ideal word, but it's, it could be a proxy to start off with and uh, one of the elements that you can evaluate. Um, asking for further information to see whether that information is credible, relevant, or coming from a trusted source and other people willing to confirm that is, is an, another way of, of verifying that, that kind of information. Um, and that's, that's pretty much how we try to handle it. And uh, we, we take the 90-10 the approach or the 80-20 approach. Rather than, than stay with our, with our arms crossed and not do anything, we're just going to play with around the flow. And if we, we make a mistake, we'll, we'll be sure to correct that uh, on the spot. Hi, my name is Rebecca Posey. I'm an, independ excuse me, an independent development consultant. And uh, my question would, would probably be most applicable for Phil, Jim, and Patrick. I'm wondering who are the organizations or the actors who have shown the most interest from a funding standpoint um, in what you're doing, whether those are clients or governments or foundations, and uh, how important is getting outside funding to the scalability of your project? Um, for me, uh, you know, I, I actually need funding right now, so. Um, <laughs> um, Here's the hat. Uh, I mean, we, so I'm kind of in a position where I, you know, we're a nonprofit and we act as this neutral third party and we found that as being kind of crucial to, to be this convening force, but, you know, between, you know, different governments and, um, and the private and public sector and everyone in between. Um, and, and so, I mean, I've been, I was fortunate to start this project off at an organization at Open Plans that already had, you know, funding that could support me for a while. Um, and then since then we've, you know, received funding from a variety of sources like, um, MacArthur and Admidyar, and uh, are increasingly starting to do work internationally with, uh, you know, with funding from entities like the World Bank and, um, and things like that. Um, but, but just in my position, you know, I, I totally depend on funding from outside sources. 
but um, the difficulty of that, and, and maybe it's just sort of our experience as, a, as an organization securing this kind of funding that's maybe sort of a, for an, potentially difficult to explain purpose, um, is looking at other models, whether that's sort of acting as like a membership model to get in, to bring in funding or, or something like that. But it's kind of an open question for us, but, um, but we definitely depend on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in our case, um, from our institution itself, we were citizen-run, citizen-led, and citizen-funded. Um, our strongest backers are private enterprise right now um, uh, in, in the local area. And uh, that's one of the challenging things that we, we're looking to overcome over the next six to 12 months, trying to change. If we're looking at a histogram of funding, we're, we're currently looking at something that's really have a bump at the right-hand side of the, of the histogram. And what we want to do is really amplify that base of, of, uh, of funding to make it sort of like this, where you have a very broad base of small contributors of citizens that are convinced of the services that we provide and, and uh, just jump on board on, on the, the bucket. I feel like the wolf in sheep's clothing. I've got these phenomenal nonprofit civic organizations, and here I am, a, a venal capitalist pig with a C corporation, <laughs> venture capital, and angel back. So um, it doesn't mean we don't have a social conscience. It just means we have a different balance sheet. Uh, I'm a partner with CMEA Capital, and uh, some of the angels include some of the better-known names in the valley, but some, some of them are a little freaked out about talking. We do have Fadi Gondor is a very well-known angel investor and entrepreneur in the Middle East who started Arabex and is on the board of Abraj Capital. He's one of our backers. And um, there's about 15 people so far that have found this to be something worth following. Okay, I have a question for the panel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you find that when you are joining conversations or starting conversations, um, what sort of analytics do you do around the hashtag sentiments that you that you either join or start? Um, what steps do you take? Do you just wait till you see something bubbling up that's now trending, or do you look to start that for yourself? We'll start at the end and work our way back. Mm -hmm. um, we we are limited in resources and have limited tools, so I'll look to Jim to see if he wants us to be an alpha customer. <laughs> um, <laughs> test it out. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so, so we go about, uh, we, Twitter, Twitter was kind enough to, to allow us to, to use the analytics function in, when, when their, um, their, uh, their platform. So we, we get some analytics to, to try to see which tweets that we make are, are uh, converting into retweets or replies. So we get a sense from that of what are the kinds of things that make sense. Um, but that's the limit of our, of our analysis thus far, but we're definitely, as I said, we're a nascent organization and trying to build that toolkit of, of analyses to, to help us do our mission better. And I guess we're more um, observers than engagers, but the key thing with clients is to make sure that the things you're searching for make sense. Um, it's a family of hashtags with exclusions. If you're following the Virginia Senate race and you want to look for George Allen, but exclude George Allen near football because the football coach is not the right George Allen. <laughs> if you want to follow Governor Perry, but not uh, uh, the singer Tim Perry. So, so there are arts of search that apply no differently to us than a Google search. Uh, but we're much more concerned with what the emerging trends are and when they quickly show velocity, what are the relative topics. And for us, we, we decided a while back not to try to create hashtags because the public is always going to be faster in a disaster situation than we are going to be. And it becomes uh, simply by, by being present on Twitter all the time and knowing you know, people in most areas of the, of the U.S. anyway. Um, we, we, they emerge very quickly and very obviously if, if you know how to use Twitter or spend any time there at all. So uh, we hop on them and then we'll share them from at Red Cross uh, fairly frequently it, it, as a situation is developing just as something useful in case other people want to figure out what hashtags they should be looking at because maybe it's not so obvious to a lot of other people. Uh, and, and so I know there are lots of states who have uh, a sort of syntax built in now, at least, and the emergency management community, hi, hi, SMEM, uh, are certainly uh, sort of, in, in Tweak the Tweet, are using a, a specific syntax around hashtags to speak with one another and, and other really engaged uh, citizens. So, but as far as the general public goes, it's usually hashtag tornado. <laughs> Um, I guess just speaking from my own personal experience, I, I feel like I often 
look more <coughs> at the users who are tweeting with the hashtag than the hashtag it, itself, um, or just you know looking at the content associated with it and sort of you know you, use my own intuition. Um, but I, I think there is definitely a distinction between hashtags that might you know have a volume of. 15 tweets a day versus those that have 1,500 per second or something like that. Um, you know, if there if there if there's too great a volume, then it's you know only really useful to machines. And sometimes that is useful. There are machines you know designed to track you know track different hashtags for a specific purpose. But otherwise, I feel like you know it, you really kind of want to have a manageable volume to you know. Sometimes there are those those uh, those hashtag sort of chats that are you know time blocked to like a couple hours, and I think sometimes that can be useful, but. Volume is one thing that I think really affects the usefulness of, of a hashtag. Real-time example, I just looked at the dashboard for natural disasters. The number one tweet was, super PACs are a natural disaster. So, <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful about what you search for. We've been doing a lot of talk about Twitter today and hashtags, but what other social media platforms do you find um, useful in your day-to-day -day engagement? Wendy. <laughs> uh, all of them. So. My, my sort of stock answer to that is I don't really care about the tools so much. I care about the people um, who are using them and making sure that, that we're providing value uh, in the spaces where our stakeholders and our communities are spending time. But uh, certainly, I mean, we haven't talked about Facebook too much. It's not, it's not as useful data-wise to us, and I think that's why these conversations often fall back on Twitter because Twitter's an open platform and, and Facebook is sort of a series of closed platforms, but certainly it's useful for us in, in times especially of disaster, what we see is an almost insatiable hunger for information from, from the American Red Cross as a, as a source uh, of, of resources, if that makes sense. And so we update as often as we possibly can to make sure that we're, we're explaining every bit of information that we have to the general public in the you know, in real time. Um, so we do that on YouTube, on Facebook, on our blog, on, on Flickr, on, on Twitter, and, and you know, maybe tomorrow we'll do it on Pinterest. Jim, if I ask that question of you, I guess it would be yeah. what do you analyze? What, what are you yeah, looking so, at? Well, I mean, the fun part about trying to build a platform is you get to pull it all in. I think Adam was saying complexity needs complexity to give you simplicity. So we take it all in, literally 40,000 blogs, news sources, every social video source, whether it's Daily Motion, Vimeo, YouTube. And once you've got it in this enormous vault of content and it's augmented with information like sentiment perspective and so on, then you can be creative how you query it. So I don't know what to look for. I let it find me and set alerts and thresholds where when something hits a certain volume level, I want to pay attention to it. And if I think I know where I'm looking, I'm going to almost always be wrong. So that's the problem. You, you sort of can't anticipate. It's the, the Gretzky theory of going where the puck is going to be because everyone else is already where the puck is. And, and if you're right a few times, then in this case with this panel, you can save lives. If you're right in the corporate world, you can make good decisions. If you're right in the political world, you can win elections. Um, and so it's really being open to peripheral vision. I think if you're overly focused and only looking at this thing here, then you're going to miss the key thing over there. Yet, if you don't look anywhere, you know, you won't see anything. So it's a tough trade-off. Um, I have two thoughts on that point. I think uh, different pl platforms have different purposes. Uh, in the case of Twitter, it, it really is a great platform and lends itself for real-time collaboration um, around certain hashtag or around a certain account. Uh, Facebook doesn't lend itself for that kind of collaboration you see there. Facebook is, is, uh, feels more like a publishing platform of things that you have done and you want to share those. I mean, we've done this and we've accomplished that and we are doing this event. Uh, it's really notifying things that are probably discrete in nature but not real time. And the, the, other, the other thought is um, you also need to open yourself up to platforms that, uh, that people use. So not everybody is comfortable with Twitter, at least in, in, in Mexico, now everybody knows how to figure out Twitter and it, it's not something that comes intuitively for the first timer. Um, so really being able to, to receive um, inputs from different channels uh, opens your, your sphere a lot more. Right. And, and Google Plus is supposed to be opening up their API, and I think that will be another fire hose to start dealing with as soon as they do. Um, so you've got to be adaptive to those changes as well. We have just a couple more minutes. So I want to, if there's anybody in the audience that has any um, last minute burning thoughts that they want to ask, now would be a great time to do it. Go ahead. I'd be curious, though, if 311 on who it 
itself is the only platform, or if there's any discussion of, I don't know, on a, on a state level or a federal level, or you know, do they work across borders for the guys in Denmark connected to the guys in India? Yeah. So I mean, the I mean, within within the the existing use case of of through and one, there's already been a lot of uh, sort of interconnection starting to happen across multiple levels of government or across jurisdictions. Um, but I think as far as other use cases, that th th those conversations are starting to develop. Um, I mean, in some in some ways, there's not really anything that technically, I think, distinguishes what uh, what the Open Through One platform does um, between what you might want to have happen in you know a crisis or emergency situation. Um, the people that we've been working with are more the people who are familiar with the sort of everyday Through and One types of things. The advantage there, I also think, is if if you can get people familiar with something. Um, that they would use on an everyday basis, whether it's social media or something that's more mundane, like you know, three-on-one reports. Then it's much more useful for when you can use that same platform and interaction when there's a crisis. Um, but um, but as an organization, we're actually looking at more opportunities for to create standards and to create these platforms. Um, and so you know, I have I have a couple of ideas, but really this is my focus right now. So one last thought before we wrap up. Um, it was mentioned a little bit about always having that peripheral view and always looking around without seeming like you're a cat that's chasing the laser pointer. Um, what do you see as the next trend that you're start, that's starting to bubble up for you? What do you see that, that when you're on your laptop at night after you go home, you think, when I get in, this is what I need to start really thinking about? For me, it's Google+. Plus. So. You know, it seems like uh, this. You know, it bubbles up after a while, and it's like, wow, we need to be there, and we need to be there now. I, I don't know. I mean, I would almost echo like um, sort of Clay Johnson sentiment. I, I almost feel like it's more about making sure I'm ignoring more. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I mean, I try and pay attention to a lot, so I, I sort of feel like there's there's definitely a skill in trying to hone, you know, exactly what you're listening to and. And I feel like that's just sort of an overall strategy that I, I, I would like to personally develop better. Same answer as before. I don't care. I follow the, the people uh, in the general public wherever they're spending time and, and certainly wherever an affected community is, is using social platforms. That's where I'm going to be paying attention. Um, yeah, I mean, I, have, I think about Google Plus because it's my job. But, uh, but I think the, the people part is a lot more important than the technology part. Yeah. Um, we're doing a lot of work on, uh, we call it discovery algorithms. If you've ever used Pandora, you know, you'll like a song, it knows why you like the song, it recommends songs. And, and discovery has two angles for us. One is what stories are likely to become important. But the other is as you use the system, you tend to respond in these ways. So rather than just giving you a dashboard that says, okay, what do you want to do? Begin suggesting, you know, Wendy, last time you assigned this to Jim, do you want to do that again? And trying to take some of that very first level, quote unquote, easy work out of your to-do list. And then you can say, no, I don't want to give that one to Jim. But we'll default to that unless you override it. So there's a lot of learning. But the whole idea of complex algorithms for discovery is meant to make it easier for you to ignore the things that don't matter. Uh, I agree. I think discovery is a big one. Um, personalized discovery is a big one. And um, this, this concept of, of uh, relevance or credibility of, of information that's actually flowing so you can filter through or curate, curate the, the fire hoses coming in with, with something that's relevant to you uh, particularly is big. And the other thought that, that more from, from the standpoint where I'm at um, that I look at is uh, I recall this, this uh, concept that uh, I saw in one of the Ushahidi um, uh, conversations was yeah, technology is probably 10% of the solution and, and the other 90% is actually the deployment of it making sure that people are using that, catching fire with it, and also making sure that the endpoints of human sensors are sending that information, and people that are empowered to actually do change are actually actioning that change so you can contribute to that cycle of collaboration. Otherwise, it'll just die out. So that's, that's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night, how to make sure that that cycle keeps on flowing. Great. Well, I want to thank everybody for participating with us today, and I want to thank the panel. They put a lot of time and hard work into this, and it was absolutely amazing to work with you all. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming to Tech at State. Have a great day. Thank you all.